Hello, everyone. And we, we welcome you to our Sunday morning roundtable discussion. Thank you all for joining us today. It's Sunday, June 21st, 1st, 2020. And we are recording from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America. And you're always welcome to come and visit us. <laughs> we will start today with our morning prayer. I'm reading from page 31 of Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures and 204 of the Blue Book. Jesus acknowledged no ties of the flesh. He said, Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Again he asked, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? implying that it is they who do the will of his father. We have no record of his calling any man by the name of father. He recognized spirit, God, as the only creator and therefore as the father of all. Oh, may you feel the touch of the spiritual idea that is the light in your path. Mary Baker Eddy. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you. All right. Our watching point today. Watch number 368. Watch lest you take human baggage with you when you retreat into the Holy of Holies. On page 32 of Science and Health, we read, quote, Jesus prayed. He withdrew from the material senses to refresh his heart with brighter, with spiritual views, end quote. One notable fact about this withdrawal was that Jesus was not striving to solve some human problem. He just wanted to refresh his heart. Usually when we seek to withdraw from the material senses, we take human problems with us so that they may be solved. But if we take a hint from the master, we will retreat into the holiest of holies without human baggage. Then when our heart is refreshed with brighter views, we may return to our problems and solve them more easily or find them already solved. Mrs. Eddy once said, quote, the scientists should make error unreal to themselves that they may make it unreal to others. And sometimes they can do more for others by going by themselves and meditating on spiritual realities. End quote. Thank you. <clears throat> Comments on that? I think that's, that's been one of the biggest uh, challenges for me, coming, having been raised in this my whole life, is now to learn I mean, to the last year and a half since I've been a member or working with um, a practitioner here that we're not healing a body. And it's, it's, I've just been, it's, um, it's just been the biggest challenge for me. I mean, I'm much more, um, I, I'm, you know, I'm doing so much better in that regard, but that still is the biggest, um, I'm not, I don't have a problem. If I have a problem in my mind and working on the truth at the same time, it's like looking up in the sky and the earth at the same time. You can't do it. You're either looking at one or the other. Or the other. And um, this has been a very helpful watch for me to remind me. And also, Ms., um, I was reminded this week that when talks about Jesus refreshing his heart he was so sure that he wasn't doing anything of himself it was all God working and he had nothing to do with it um, that also you know re refresh my heart who do I think is working here <laughs> and was, so that was also very very helpful this week thank, thank you. you and thank you for picking them out Karen Oh, you're so welcome. <laughs> and, just to, and just to finish that thought, what was Jesus' responsibility in his whole mission here? To, 
I can of mine own self do nothing. Right. But he did a lot. And how did he do it? He, he went where he was at and he said what he was told to say. <laughs> well, he was obedient. To his yeah. And that's yeah. all we ever have to do, isn't it? <laughs> but we yeah. do have responsibility. It's not our will. It's our obedience. That is our responsibility. So thank you for pointing that out. And you know, also it's in the holy of oh, excuse me. <laughs> well, I was just going to say the holy of holies was the place that only the priest, the highest priest, could go into. And in that holy of holies was the ark of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, I recall. And so, if we if we start with that. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I mean, there you go. <laughs> yeah, if you're claiming another power or presence. You're starting off with being disobedient. That's very exactly. good. Exactly. Yep. That's that's our first rule of obedience. Um, yeah. You know, it can be challenging because when we pray or when we think we're going quietly to God, we can often just drag all our baggage with us, all these things we want healed, all of this stuff going on in our heads. And this is what this watching point is saying, to, to drop the baggage. We were taught here before we come to a church service, we drop the baggage at the door before we come in. Don't bring it all in. And then when you leave, you'll find it healed and taken care of. And that's why, because you've refreshed your thought. And in refreshing your thought, you see what you thought you had a problem. You see it in its right light, and it's no longer a problem anymore. Is that not true? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was, I was interested. I, I read this definition. You know, a lot of talk now is on about mindfulness. And I saw this definition from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary on mindfulness. The practice of maintaining a non-judgmental state of heightened or complete awareness of one's thoughts, emotions, or experience on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. And I thought all these years, it's to a large degree what Christian science is, teaches us to be aware of our thought. What are we thinking? To be mindful so, you know, I read this it, in the article I was reading it. It was like this huge discovery. But I thought, well, in, in science, this is what we're taught. Be mindful of what you're thinking and accept only those thoughts that come to you from God and reject the others. In the lesson this week with uh, Jesus in the boat, what was he doing in the boat when the storm was raging? Sleeping. Sleeping. And when he got up? What two things did he do? Oh, maybe more than two, but. <laughs> well, he said, be not afraid. Or why, yeah. why are you so afraid? Yes. And then two more after that. But then he actually spoke. Yeah. Peace, be still. That was but the second thing. The that second thing, but what the first. <laughs> rebuked the wind. He, re he rebuked. He rebuked. Yeah. You rebuke the error, and then you claim you bring in the truth. <laughs> so first he handled the fear, then he rebuked the error, then he brought in the, cr the Christ truth, and that's peace, be still, the stillness of it. So remember that. Remember that in your own thinking when you get these negative thoughts. You rebuke the fear, fear not address that fear, and then rebuke it, and then bring in peace, be still. It works. And the bringing in of the peace is really demanding the blessing. And again, as you mentioned earlier, this is not human will. This is the peace that only God can give. Remember, yeah. Jesus said, yeah. my peace I give you, not as the world giveth. Yeah. The world can't give you peace. <laughs> <laughs>
And but, if you try to do it willfully, you will you will maybe achieve it for two minutes and then really fall flat on your face because I've done it so many times. It's, it's impossible to do it in a willful manner. It has to be the spirit of God moving in and getting yourself out of the way and letting him him work. And, and, and this is the point. Go ahead, Florence. Go ahead. Uh, no, I think this is why the example of Jesus is absolute meekness. He was nothing of himself. All everything he did, whatever he said, as the Father directs, and it's such a beautiful thing to try to 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 emulate. Because then you are out of the way. Then you are seen through the only framework, which is the God framework, the clear framework. And I, I'm feeling that when he retired to refresh himself, it was to just to be so clear of this oneness that I am nothing of myself, God doing everything. And it, it's a beautiful example, I feel. It, it certainly you. is. Thank you. Yes. So any other comments on this watching point? I just wanted to say the watching point kind of helped me to see why so often I wake up in the morning and, and kind of have that answer to something that was going on or whatever, because, you know, like I've been taught here to uh, end the night with clearing the slate and then, you know, wake up in the morning, God is my mind. And <laughs> so often, hundreds of times since I've been here, the answer to some, something has come up right then. So. Yes, in the stillness of the morning. You know, Mrs. Eddie kept a um, pencil and paper notepad by her bed because she knew that. And sometimes she'd even wake up in the night and write things down. In that quiet and that stillness, if if you've done your work at night to clear your thought. And sometimes you, you can even, you know, pose the question that you might have. Something's bothering you. Father, give me the answer. And it, it might not have come all day, but in the in the stillness of sometimes the night or the early morning, the answer will be there because your thought is clear and at peace and not striving or thinking or telling God, God, I need this. I've got to write a lesson. God, I've just written 20 of them. I can't think of a new idea. What am I going to do? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and so, no, that doesn't work. But you cut that all out and just get quiet. Father, you have the answer. You'll give it to me when I'm ready to receive it and it'll come. That's one example of how that works, but there are many, many, many others. <laughs> so, okay, so our subject is the universe, including man, evolved by atomic force. And Carol, will you read the golden text? <clears throat> From Matthew. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Thank you. And that, that was to what Lawrence read in her prayer this morning. And also, as we know, we're handling the belief of Father's Day. And, um, you know, years ago we were told this story <clears throat> that it was about a, a, a king and a queen. They had a son, and the son was stolen, taken away from his home and he lived with a band of vagabonds i guess you would say and and lived in pretty much misery and uh poverty and in the meantime his father the king was searching and searching and searching for him and eventually did find him rejoicingly and brought him home and that son found out that he in fact had been the son of a king a prince and the, the moral of the story is that with us we seem to have a human heritage sometimes good sometimes terrible sometimes in between but the truth of it is we've always been the son or the daughter of the king and once that boy got home he found out all, everything, all that I have is thine, as we read in the story of the prodigal son. He had everything, always. He just didn't know it. And so it is with us. 
whatever our human background has been, God has always been our Father, Mother, God. And all things, all that he has is yours. And that's the truth. And it's just a matter of claiming it. Sooner or later, we all must claim it. Some of us never know it. And that is where we get the message out so that they do know it. And once you start claiming it, it is yours. You will find it's yours because the Father has always been pouring out his love. And, and truly, it doesn't matter how badly you were treated. Um, it can all vanish as a bad dream. And when you, and when you find it, nobody can take it from you. It's the one thing that you have that nobody can steal. Oh, they better not try to. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. And that's, we're going to get into this good today. So I just want to say it reminds me of that testimony she gave about my daddy says. <laughs> I know it. We always quote Ava. My daddy says. My daddy says what what your father in heaven says is the truth, and that that negates what anyone else tells you. Ava would tell what anyone else. My daddy says that, that's the authority. It's a good thing to remember. I, I am I'm struck too with my grandchildren. If you know if their if their mother or father didn't say it, well, it just doesn't wash. You know, it's one day, and isn't that that's great? That's a good way to be brought up. And then they learn to transfer all of that to the to God. One thing happened years ago is the human family and the household is so strengthened by just trying to imitate what God would want. And, and uh, just to the point, I lost my mother years ago. One day, my dad must have heard something in church, and it was all is all that I have is thine. And I was young, and he said that to me, and it struck so pure and true that I, I didn't know where he got it, but I, it sounded like he meant it. And, I, and now I know he got it from the Bible. And then it it bound me over the years to him because probably the truest sense of love that I, I felt from him. So these, all these readings that we get, what we take from we're God. It really purifies and strengthens our own human households. You know that's so beautiful. <clears throat> that is just beautiful. One statement of truth like that. It affected Craig his whole life. That's just beautiful. Now, responsive reading. I'll have you read it, Craig. Number twenty-six. Sure. <clears throat> And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Thank you. Now, and that, that was the theme of Gary's readings a couple of Wednesdays ago. And so here we are again, <laughs> telling us something very, very significant. And today we're going to get into something very important. Um, I'm going to have Florence speak to it, but I, I want to read to you. A dear person named Jill wrote on, on the uh, YouTube comments. Yeah, the roundtable from last week. Yeah, the roundtable from last week, the one about the hip hypnosis machine. Anyway, she writes... Christian scientists have a long history with racism within their branch churches and the mother church. As a single Terry, hello, <laughs> will discuss the evils of Hitler and the Holocaust. However, they ignore the evils of hate and racism. They would rather pretend the crimes against humanity committed by whites did not happen. Christian science churches were segregated and journals labeled, quote, colored Christian science practitioners, end quote. If man is spiritual, why were practitioners labeled by their race? Ignoring what is going on in this country regarding hate and racism is in itself an evil. Stop being mesmerized by hate and power. This roundtable discussion only tried to relieve your own guilt. Racism is not about skin color. It's about hate and white supremacy. 
Racism is animal magnetism that you do not attempt to heal. Now, I wrote her back and I said I was truly sorry that that's what she got from the round table, which is true. But, um, and she wrote me back a very loving reply, which I was very grateful for. But I did not know this. I, did, I, I was very naive about this topic that she brought up. And so we are going to discuss it. And dear, our new person, Carrie from California, found all of this history um, about our church. A part that I did not know. And so we're going to discuss this because it does go with this lesson. Who is our father and mother? And she's absolutely right. If we're all spiritual, honestly, it never occurred to me that there would be racism in the Christian science church. It seems impossible. How could that be? It didn't even occur to me. That's how naive I was. So, Florence, I'll let you speak first. And for well, I think that's why I, I said before that I couldn't see how Mrs. Eddy, the revelator, the demonstrator of this science for the whole world, could think that way if she sat in the evenings as we, re we read, blessing the whole world regardless of who is what. So I was surprised a few years ago, someone who was a reading room uh, attendant told me that she's found um, journals where black practitioners were uh, in the, after their name was a parenthesis colored. And I was really surprised. I was very surprised. And then after that, I saw another article in one journal, more recent, uh, where Betty Thompson, she's been a practitioner for a long time, talks about, you know, this kind of wickedness in the church. And as Mary says, now Carrie uh, sends all these things which really validate what's, what has gone on. It sounds as if from 1922 is when this started, where black practitioners had colored by their names. Even their churches had to have colored uh, after it. But, I mean, where is this? What, <laughs> what kind of ridiculousness is that? Um, the truth is also colored. I mean, <laughs> or is the church yeah. the water fountains and stuff like that? So it's a, it's just a little bit disturbing. But... I just have learned to pray, you know, go to God with everything, and the answers I've gotten has kept me going. So, uh, but it's alarming to think that, you know, a church like that, as Mary says again, uh, could have such thought in it. I think it went on, this labeling went on from 22 till maybe 56, because one of this, uh, the first practitioners, um, black. Mrs. Miss Webb, Marietta Webb, that carries articles and stuff referred to, she tried to, um, you know, to fight against that labeling. I'm not sure if it happened while she was here, but she, you know, she may have just passed on because she passed on in 51, and I think it was 56, 1956, when this, this um, unnecessary, whatever you want to call it, stopped. It, 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 this is a very, very grievous. Um, and so, and I, I, this is so important that we bring this out because if anybody anywhere thinks that Christian science is a white person's religion, holy Moses, wouldn't ever love that? Are you kidding me? It's at the exact opposite. I'm like outreach <laughs> to, to a degree. And I, I'm grateful to Jill that she said what she did. Thank God she spoke up because now we did all this researching. Wait till you hear what's to come now. Wait till you hear. I just wanted to say, I just realized that that was right after the um, litigation. Litigation. Right. The litigation. Well, right, from 21 right. to 22. Yeah. 22, right when they got done. Yeah, writing. yeah. I mean, a little history here is really, really important because <clears throat> Mrs. Eddy prayed the whole world. And she once told her white students in Boston that she, she prayed for Africans because they needed her more than they did. Yeah. She, she, 
She he said, loved Reverend all Mary mankind. Baker Eddy shared how she made a high priority of praying for people throughout the world, and she specifically mentioned Africans. She wrote, I'm helping them. You have less need of me than they have. Now, in, in the 1910, what did the board of directors do? They changed the manual. <laughs> They turned the organization into a human organization. They violated the manual. Then in 1917 or 18, they sued to take over the independent uh, publishing society. And they illegally and immorally took over the publications in 1921, turning, turning the mother church organization into a big central human organization and they lost it they totally lost it they lost the spirit of christian science they turned it into a human organization and then they followed all of these stupid racist state laws state laws yeah. and that was it. it it is brought out here because at first i was very disturbed but it, it in some of these articles it was brought out it wasn't only it wasn't just the church that there were these they called them jim crow laws yeah. segregation and and in some places it's it and and i have to mention birmingham alabama they had had a integrated church and because of the jim crow laws they had to change that and they did not want to OK, but I guess there was pressure from the government. That's why we don't like big government. <laughs> Please let us think for ourselves. And there were other examples of that. So it wasn't just entirely the church. It wasn't the people in the church. If you told me that it's the white people's church and, and even in the little area of Jamaica where I live, it was a teeny little cubicle so type of thing, like a about the size of our, um, I mean, our, our, our reading room. It was just teeny. You could walk right by and miss it almost. And it was just a curiosity. It was just that, you know, most of, a lot of people there were ethnic, all sorts. And it was just a tiny little spot across from the Macy's, but... You know, it was called basically. This is a white person's church. Oh, and that's disgusting. Yeah, I mean, they were labeled, labeled. I mean, disgusting. Yeah. And I'm not swearing. God damns that sort of thing. Right. Uh, absolutely. Because it's not right. It's not of God. That's not what Mrs. Eddie has given the world. So. No, it is not Christian Science. I I just did research all day yesterday on this. And she found that some people did break the law, the Jim Crow law. Do you want well, to some were functioning? And actually, all I wanted to bring out was right before the lawsuit, we've talked about this um, organization that they um, did the committee, the committee report where Martha Wilcox was part of it. And they had to answer questions. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the questions that came up. And what stood out to me was she, that group was recommending to the board that the individual localities should demonstrate and she felt that christian science could demonstrate and that these people would be able to work together but that it should be in localities and that's where we have 1922 when they won the lawsuit they decided to make it the mother church to dictate for everybody and i just want to mention too and this was not what i was looking up but during the lawsuit some of the worst violence took place and they have a, I think 1919 was one of the bloodiest. And so I think there's a correlation. That and it was also, where? wasn't there a what? pandemic too at yes, that time? During, uh, a, a, a violence. Oh, the violence around place, the country. Yeah, around the country. And it was during this lawsuit. The great litigation. The great litigation. Mm, 1918 was the Spanish flu. So right, Spanish right. Flu. And, but they right. recommended yeah. it be lo different localities and demonstrate to demonstrate and, well, and, were demonstrating. and a true scientist and I don't care what era they lived in you could not read this book science and health and not get this I, I can't I ju it's beyond me but so we we you know unfortunately this is it and this is heartbreaking i mean and i have more respect now for craig than i ever have because oh my god so thank you <laughs> uh, I, you know 
You love the truth. You That's love the truth yeah. enough to get over this, that we are a white church. And I'm telling you, ever since we became independent, and I, honestly, as a child, I, I can't remember I, I, what it was like, but we've always had mixed, right? It's been yeah. mixed. We've never had just all white people in our church. Never. Um, that I recall. So anyway, who is trying to speak? Uh, you want to... Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, I, there's an article uh, in the journal from, I think, early 2000s, where the first, I think it's the first African-American uh, lecturer um, speaks about her experience, I think in the 80s or 90s, but she was scheduled or booked to um, speak all over the country. And one by one, um, I guess a lot of the churches that had scheduled her did not know that she was African American. And once they found out, they canceled all her like most many of her lectures. Well, yeah, and, and, go ahead. No, I think it's the same journal that I have. That lady, I think it's Betty Thompson, who who is the was a lecturer, and she writes about these reactions. But she had overcome a lot of prejudice before, anyway, in different circumstances, in different places. So I, I guess she was prepared to, you know, take it and go where she was received and give great lectures. Great. Yeah. Uh, Mike? What I was going to say was that uh, uh, pressure from the state really is no excuse from any Christian scientist because uh, Plainfield did not completely abandon uh, church services even when the state was, New Jersey that is, was doing the lockdown. Where there's a will, there's a way. No, and uh, Very true. I agree with I'm that. Going to, I'm going to go back to Mary Baker Eddy herself and uh, I never really read the 1878 second edition of Science and Health, which I've had for years, because there were supposed to be two volumes, and only one got of the two got published. It had even worse results. She had even worse results getting it published than the original first edition. As a matter of fact, the second edition has this one whole page of uh, corrections for that that volume that I have, there's uh, word changes and commas and periods that they mistakenly changed, and there's this whole page that tells you where they are and where they need to be. But going back to that, uh, there's twice in that book, and I read that. Um, one was uh, where she talks about the, this is kind of paraphrasing, that the... Uh, Sins of Jefferson Davis, who was the president of the Confederacy, are not absolved by the martyrdom of John Brown. Now, John Brown makes uh, every one of our today's protesters, even the uh, <laughs> ones that go in there and burn buildings, kind of calm because he had an armed insurrection. He tried to start an armed insurrection, take over the... Uh, uh, Fort and Harper's Ferry, I believe it was, to arm the African slaves to uh, revolt against their masters. And he was captured and hung for that, for treason. And the interesting thing was, I think they even gave him an out, or if he admitted to his sins, uh, sins of trying to free slaves, that uh, they would not hang him. But he said he would rather be hung than to uh, go against his you know, what his soul told him. So, I mean, he was a, he was an extremist. He was a terrorist. He was any label you want to throw at him. And yet, Mrs. Eddy compares him, you know, essentially as a martyr to the likes of, uh, of uh, John, who they tried to martyr. And, uh, and the, I mean, Jesus, who was put on the cross. The other one is this Charles Sumner. And she, totally exalts him for his moral standard. And he was an anti-slavery uh, senator. And I should have known this. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't, maybe it was never taught. 
when I looked up to see what his claim to fame was, it turned out that for his railing against slavery, uh, that was the whole time of admitting uh, that Missouri and Kansas would they be slave states or free states and such, uh, he was actually ambushed by Southern congressmen and beaten just about to death on the Senate floor. It yeah. just is unbelievable. And Mrs. Eddy respected, revered, and exalted these people. And as a matter of fact, going back to John Brown, there was a time, uh, like 1892, believe this or not, I mean, 30 years after, or 40 years after he was uh, executed, they decided that the man was insane. So from 1890 to the 1970s, they declared him as being an insane man for doing what he did. And this is Eddie revered these people. Exactly. Yeah. Well, they they try to they try to dirty the names of those who who have stood who, who and stand for right. Yes, yeah. and, and are willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. He also was way ahead. I've read about all these people. That's why we all need to know our history. Um, yes, I've read recently about John Brown, and he was also way ahead as far as women's rights. You know, all women, everybody should vote, and um, and he lived his life that way too. He had all these people to his home. Um, it wasn't just he preached it and didn't live it. And he was, and, and he was all based on the Bible. He had married a, a someone who was very extremely re religious, and and um, he felt so strongly he was ready to give his life, and not just his life, the life of his sons for this cause. So, and anyone who met him respected him. They they would all shut up and listen to what he had to say, even before he was going to be hung <laughs> because what he said he spoke from the bible and he spoke from his heart and he rebuked those who didn't agree with with him because what he was saying was true but you know before his time if you will anyway Here, here's it, a funny side okay mike but i'm gonna have to there's i have yep, a lot yep, yep. Real, okay. real quick there's a funny side note on him is that his uh, father had an apprentice by the name of jesse grant who was Ulysses S. Grant's father. Oh, wow. I didn't know and that. And then the other one that I love is that he got his, uh, John Brown got his start trying to get a fair price for wool growers' wool and uh, discovered that the buyers didn't care about the quality of the wool. They just cared about getting it as cheap as they could and selling as high as they could. Well... <laughs> The thing is, we want to make absolutely clear in this cl in this class is that Mrs. Eddy was <laughs> no respecter of persons. Absolutely not. She loved all races. Her science was for this, for the liberation of all mankind. This is not a white person's religion, for God's sakes, never. And you see, the fact, I have to bring this out because the fact that it's still whispered about, we have to get rid of this because this this would block, wait till you hear what more I have to say, this would block the growth of all our races and are getting along together. Did you know our first, one of our first astronauts was a black person and, and he was a Christian scientist. And then I never knew this either. I'd always heard about the Arkansas Nine even after the civil rights movement gained momentum, even after 1954, when racial segregation was overturned by the United States Supreme Court, Afro-Americans faced ongoing disadvantages of intense prejudice in America. A well-known example of hostility against Afro-Americans was seen in 1957 when the federal government forcibly mandated school desegregation, starting with an all-white high school in Arkansas called Little Rock Central High. Melba Beals was a high school junior when she became one of the first black students there, a member of a group dubbed Little Rock Nine, almost overnight becoming a famous civil rights figure because of the publicity surrounding the event and extreme threat she faced for being a pioneer. Four decades later, she received the highest congressional award for her role in the civil rights movement. She told her personal story in a best-selling award-winning book, called Warriors Don't Cry. She shared some insights into her practice of Christian science in an interview published in the Christian Science Sentinel. 
We were not heroes at that time, Miss Beals told the Sentinel, because we did not believe that people would behave as it would turn out that they did. We didn't believe that huge mobs would attack us. We were simply making a decision for better education. She mentioned having acid thrown in her eyes, burning paper towels dropped on her bathroom, and having to escape from angry, violent crowds threatening to kill her. Her grandmother had a copy of Signs and Health with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy and a resulting unshakable conviction that there could never be a day or a circumstance without evidence of God's love. And she helped her granddaughter survive the ordeal of physical and verbal attacks that were part of her daily education at Little Rock Central High. Through this testing experience, Beals became a dedicated Christian scientist. Science and Health, she explains, speaks of God seeing as each of us as equal and of God's constant presence for us. It doesn't say that God is present only for someone of a particular color, shape, height, weight. It's quite clear on the point that we are ever in the presence of love. You must see God expressed in everyone. This is from an article which we now have on our website, which you all should read, called an excerpt from dedication building the Seattle branches of Mary Baker Eddy's church, a centennial story by a Cindy Safran, if I probably pronounced that wrong. And it was just Safranoff. Safranoff. It was just published in February, 2020. And she goes on to say that the air force major Robert H. Lawrence became the first Afro-American selected to be an astronaut. She said civil, civil rights figures like Beals opened the way for other Afro-Americans in succeeding years of progress, and, and they made it in, in society. And there's a whole list of all these people through studying science and health, their lives were lifted, elevated. And not only that, they learned the power of forgiveness. You know, last week, um, Florence talked about the reform that must the reform and the repentance that must take place. And this is true. And even maybe we weren't individually involved in some of this racism as, as scientists, we must, we must purge the church of any trace of it. And we can, right? Yes. What else? We must. And if we do this, think what a, a great release this will be for all nations. We're all of one blood. And also this this article, she she starts out bringing, speaking about something very interesting. On Sunday, February first, nineteen seventy, the newest Christian Science Reading Room in Seattle officially opened. This was the newest joint activity of the Churches of Christ Scientists, located in the commercial district called Madison Park, at one 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 four thirty fourth Street between East Union and East Spring Spring Streets. It was referred to as a central area reading room. This new outreach effort met an urgent need. The central district or central air area was unique in Seattle, and so was this joint activity. The outreach was initiated, managed, and staffed by Afro-Americans, and its purpose was to uplift for the people of African ancestry. She goes on, she talks about a Milton Simons with an S, not Milton Simon, and that uh, Mrs. W. Smith, who established this area. Now, I could be wrong, but I think this is the area that Seattle's having a trouble mm -hmm. with. And I wondered if that church in that reading room is still there. Maybe someone can investigate that. But this Milton Simons with an S, he was he was part Afro American. He was part Indian. He was part everything, and and he he was a great um, free thinker. And he played all kinds of music and instruments, and and he just brought he he went into that section and just brought life and enthusiasm. And he was also a Christian scientist. So wherever wherever it is, wherever science is, wherever true Christ Christianity is. There is progress and healing. Even in that movie, Harriet Tubman, that was out, Harriet, recently. I mean, there were some really bad people, but there were some really good people, too. And some of them were white, and most of them were real Christians. Some lost their lives. Some lost their lives for it. 
and some are willing to lose their lives. And and we fought a civil war with a lot of people who losing their lives over this. So um, th- this this is what's going to bring the healing, and it's just so important. And I'm so grateful to Jill for telling me, and then Florence for telling me. Now I'm going to have now Gary read this. This is a Mary Marietta Webb. She was one of the first blacks in 1899. She had tremendous healing. She had a very sick son who was healed. And that that testimony was handpicked by Mrs. Yes. Eddy to be put in fruitage. It's It starts on page 612. It, I think it's called A Remarkable Case. All right? So now... This is from a November 23rd, 1899 issue of the Christian Science Sentinel. I'm going to have Gary read it. And it's written by her, Marietta Webb, who later became the practitioner who had to fight this idea that she was colored. And she fought it and said, I'm not, I'm just a person like everybody else. And that was after Mrs. Eddy. After Mrs. Eddy. And you wouldn't find her testimony here because it's not distinguished among anyone else. No, it's not. It doesn't say colored. <laughs> so, Mrs. Eddy, you set the example. I wonder why. <laughs> Example, right? Okay, right. No. Damn Jim Crow laws that, that screw things up. Anyway, uh, the protecting power of truth by Marietta T. Webb, uh, 1899 Journal Sentinel. One Sunday morning a year ago, last August, while seated in church and my head bowed in silent prayer, I had a presentment of my home being in danger of fire. I took in the situation in a second. We had not had any rain since the early spring, and the excessive heat of the summer had made everything very dry. For a moment, I thought what a terrible loss it would be if such were the case. Then fear began to creep upon me when suddenly I was confronted with truth, which says, I am applicable not only in the treatment of diseases, but in all the difficulties and trying places of life. I at once began to demonstrate the truth. Sweet peace stole over me, and when the silent prayer was ended, and we were repeating the Lord's Prayer with the spiritual interpretation, I forgot my presentment for the time being. When I arrived home from church, the first thing that met my sight were signs of fire. Two of my neighbors, who had rushed in to assist my husband in putting out the fire, met me with frightened looks on their faces, and exclaimed there with uplifted hands, Oh, Mrs. Webb! I don't know what saved your home or your husband. Aren't you frightened? To their amazement and my husband's, who had his hands and arms bandaged, I calmly answered, no. I then went on to explain why I was not alarmed or even surprised. And they marveled at it, although I had often spoken to them about the wonders that God's truth will perform. I did not look at the burns that my husband had received, nor did I bandage them. And in a day or so, they were all healed. The fire was caused by the explosion of a bottle of gasoline, which had been left standing in the hot sun. At first, there was a slight explosion, which sent the cork flying out, followed by a little flame, which instantly ignited a curtain. And this attracted my husband's attention. In grabbing the bottle to throw it out of doors, it exploded and went to pieces in his hands the fire from it running up his arm and also igniting the woodwork at his feet. The damage to our home was very slight. Surely the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. The Bible and science and health with key to the scriptures are my daily guides, the heavenly manna on which I feast and live. O glorious truth that makes us free, that guides us into all the avenues and through all the vicissitudes of life, that is a healing balm for all complaints, and that protects us from all evil, and which I verily believe is to be the only salvation of my race, the African American, and that it will abolish the prejudice which exists throughout these United States. For go where we will, we are made to feel our color, But with the wide and rapid spread of Christian science, man is not only learning what the true love of God is by loving all mankind, 
but he is getting out of his old prejudiced self into the spiritual sense of man's union with God. I want all this stuff on our website. Um, it also says Miss, Miss Webb joined the Mother Church in June 1899. She decided to become a Christian science nurse in 1911, but soon after that changed her mind and became a Christian science practitioner instead. In June 1933, she invited a local black Christian scientist who were not always welcome at branch churches to hold Sunday services at her home. That informal group was soon organized as the Christian Science Society Colored of Los Angeles. <laughs> it was on. She, she built a big church, actually, and we have a beautiful picture of her late in her years, which, um, which shows her, I guess she had a, a problem with her eyes. She could read perfectly fine without glasses. At the age of 80. At the age of 86. 86. And then this, our bell is rung, but um, this was written by, and this was also dealing with the gay rights problem as well. It was written, it's signed, it just says, a journal listed practitioner, no longer colored. <laughs> she writes overcoming discrimination was a long hard struggle for me one little word colored beside my name in the cs journal clouded my thinking and tried to tell others that my race was inferior the members of my race couldn't practice christian science healing with the same degree of success as others whose mortal bodies were another color that we should confine our practice and the sharing of the truth and love to our own people the prayer of the Pharisee, Luke 18. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men. If never spoken aloud, was sadly evident in many hearts during those years when we begged and pleaded, reasoned and prayed to free Mrs. Eddy's structure of truth and love from the evil grip of racial discrimination. Children of Ham or children of God, indeed. <laughs> Yeah. What a travesty on the spiritual truth on which the blessings of Christian science are based. So you see the struggle, but we get it out now that this is everyone's religion. And I thank all these people who researched that Cindy and Carrie for finding so much of these things and all of you. And we will shout it from the rooftops because, goodness me, this is the true science. And this is Eddie. And it's time. It's past mm -hmm. time. It's yes. past time. Yeah. Yes. So it's the only framework that will change the world, I feel really strongly. It's the only thing that spiritual view. That's it. Thank exactly. You. And Florence is such a wonderful example of that. And believe me, her. Her practice is every color under the sun. <laughs> thank, God, thank God for that. Mm. And that's how it should be, because we're we're all of one blood, as we said. Okay. Time for us to leave, Will. All right. Let's go have a good service. Yes. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.